Are you scared? I'm, I'm really, really scared. I'm scared. This is my impression of Jigsaw if he was an eight-year-old child. Hello, Mom and Dad. I'd like to play a game. Do you, do you have any games on your phone that I could play, please? I like the Kitos. I like the Kitos. I like the Kitos. I like the Kitos. I've got her. Thumbs up. I don't remember the <laughs> Rebels! Rebels! You can't tell me what to do. You're not my dad. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Hey! Yes. Sorry, honey. I don't want to yell it in front of the. I know. I know. Into the microphone. That's okay. So just directly, not you. Sorry. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's sweeping the nation. But only real fans, true hardcore fans of this podcast who have been with us since the beginning would know two, two, the two main facts. The two things you need to know, the two major facts, true, 100% true, and not really real truth and not made up on the spot facts about the both of us, Bunny and Mei Lin. The first fact, which is about you, Bunny, is that when you're not doing the podcast, you are, in fact, a celebrated plastic surgeon. So tell us, Bunny, what part of the world of plastic surgery is your speciality? Uh I specialize more in, you know, I, I, I can't do things like rhinoplasty and just nose reductions yeah. and let's lift your cheek and give you a cute little chin. No, I am an artist. I am an artist who has studied under Pablo Picasso and... Plastic surgery is my passion. Just because God put your nose in the middle of your face doesn't mean that that's where it needs to stay. And that's why you chose this week's film. That is correct. Surgery is, is correct. the new sex. Everybody you, knows that. You have a much better scope of vision if your eyes were where your nipples are. Very true. I have it's always like thought that. Point of gravity yeah. with a wide scope and a lot of peripheral vision. I have always thought that. 100%. I have always thought that. 
I'm so most, glad that's most mouths should be completely removed. Finally. You know? Finally, someone is not scared to say the, the real stuff, the real truth. And I, I, I am thankful for you, buddy. I am very thankful for you. You can eat rectally, but you haven't had shit to say in years. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> and the second fact, which is about me, uh, it, it, if, if you think that this is a bit strange and awkward, just FYI, the edibles have kicked in. There we go. Which, which I am uh, legally taking. Uh, the judge said it was okay. And the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this point is I like to find a story from the history books and sort of reword it via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's historic approximation! Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anybody wants me to or not. Now, personally, I, I like the name Shap. It's short, it's plucky, it's fun, it's got moxie. It's like my ex Debbie, but without the drug dependency and the stinky ferret smell. Anywho. <laughs> That was a deep burn. Ouch. This week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be looking at the life of a high school teacher and minister whose insane fixation definitely puts the OMG in OCD. This guy wrote so frigging much that basically he's the patron saint of writers, the new patron saint of writers. A new saint for a new era. So move over, St. Francis de Sales, the Roman Catholic saint of writers and journalists, whose feast day is January 24th. And once again, I'd like to take this time to salute Wikipedia, the official savior of podcasters everywhere. Salute! Uh, today's chap is about a man, the late great Reverend Robert W. Shields, as I, or as I like to think of him, the new and improved patron saint of writers. So this guy, this friggin' guy, yeah. and I put, and I put, to be clear, <laughs> to show you exactly how much I write this out. I wrote Italian hand gestures in parentheses. Hey. This friggin' guy. This gabaragoo. This. So he was born in 1918 in Seymour, Indiana, a town so small that it's actually smaller than my own small town. So. I'm really sorry and apologize to all the people of Seymour, Indiana. But hey, congrats on being the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. Yes. Who was born in Seymour, Indiana. Ooh, we're the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. Wow, check out the big dick on Seymour, Indiana. <laughs> Apparently, that's where Jack and Diane are from. Two American kids growing up in the heartland of Seymour, Indiana. So good why, on you, Seymour. Since, since we're there for a moment, why yes. did it take so many decades and decades for people to realize that sucking on a chili dog was a stupid fucking line? Sucking on a chili dog. Behind the days to freeze. The thing is, is that he just wanted the chili. He didn't want the dog. So no. he would just put the entire hot dog in his mouth, suck all the chili off of it, and then just throw the hot dog in the trash. Yeah. That's how people eat in Seymour, Indiana. We know that now. 
So, um, hey, good on you, Seymour, Indiana. Man, no one famous was born in my small town in Oklahoma. Except for the celebrated astronaut Gordon Cooper. And John, the... Uh, John and the Ian Cougar Mellencamp has always seemed to me somebody who is celebrated far more than his music deserved. <laughs> well, I swear to you, Bunny. This is the year 2022. We should rightly be saying, John, who? Who is this person that Malin is talking about? Who is this John yeah. Cougar? We're really that that she is we're... referencing. I don't know who he is. That's how history really should great... have gone. Man, this is why we're so popular with the young people. We're always saying such uh, timely young references, like John Cougar Mellencamp. Yes. he doesn't. He doesn't go by the cougar anymore. No, fuck him. Drop the cougar. You can't put in a cougar and then take it back out again, bitch. I one hundred percent John Cougar Melon Camp. I'll let I you believe have the I mentioned camp begrudgingly. I I I believe I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but this blows my mind. Sometime last decade. Sometime between uh, 2010 and 2020. Stephen King wrote a musical with T-Bone Burnett and John Cougar Mellencamp. He wrote a horror musical called The Ghost Brothers of Dark, Darkland, Darkhold, Darkland County. And some of the music is great. And he, he wrote this play and he got T-Bone Burnett and John Cougar Mellencamp to write spooky music to go with it and he he traveled around America with a cast they made a uh, a like a like a full cast a recording of it on CD and it features some famous names like the devil is played by Elvis Costello one of the brothers is played by all right all right all right and it's surprising that Stephen King wrote a musical that no one has effing heard of. Yeah. But it's good. It's pretty good. Where have but you seen or heard this? We got the official uh the official book in at the bookstore when I worked at the bookstore and it came with the CD of music and I'm like, "Wait, Stephen King wrote a musical?" Why is this the first time I've heard about it? And I looked it up, and yeah, it was uh, it it was supposedly like a really great musical, and they toured it across America, and the hope was that eventually it would, you know, maybe make it to Broadway, but it never did. And so they stopped touring with the musical. But Stephen King wrote a musical with John Cougar Mellencamp and T Bone Burnett. There's a song called "Tear This Cabin Down." It is effing beautiful. I yeah. freaking love that song, and I listen to it all the time. And it's from that musical. Yeah, it's weird. So, uh, oh, yes. What were we talking about? What was the place I lost? Seymour, Indiana. Yes. That's where the Reverend Robert W. Shields was born. It's also the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. And I was talking about how my small town in Oklahoma has no one famous that was born here. Except for um, celebrated astronaut Gordon Cooper and the indie band Shiny Toy Guns. Oh, and also this actor. You probably have never heard of him. Brad Pitt! Yeah. But hey, it's not a contest. It's not a contest. So, Bunny, uh, this is where I went down a pretty steep rabbit hole. So I was born in a small town in Arizona, and the only real famous person born there... MILF porn actress Holly Sampson. Okay. I K I was born in the same small town as MILF porn actress Holly Sampson. And I said, Holly Sampson, I don't know who that is. 
there are some porn actresses from <coughs> in in my path that I could tell you. I could tell you about Stormy Daniels. I could ter- tell you about Sarah J. But I was trying to think of like Holly Sampson. That's a name that rings a bell. How do I know the name Holly Sampson? Well, apparently she was one of several women linked to the numerous infidelities of Mr. Tiger Woods. Okay. And, and, and I, Wikipedia is great, but it can also be a drug. So I'm trying to write about the Reverend Robert W. Shields. Then suddenly I'm learning about the small town of Seymour, Indiana. And suddenly I'm learning about Tiger Woods' numerous infidelities. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's why we hate him now. Yes. Tiger Woods was everywhere. And then suddenly he got a DUI and he started banging a bunch of chicks. And we stopped. We, like, shut him down in society. Of course we shut him down. Because how they're a non-white person. Either. Yes. Yes. I believe that if he was white, he would have been forgiven. Absolutely. If if Mel Gibson is still allowed to make movies, yeah. I mean, also, Dang. That, like he was the media darling, you know, the yeah. young, young up and coming, blah blah blah. Oh my God, did you see this person of color, this media sensation? Yeah. And then it, yeah, fizzled out because they were like, oh, he's a cheater. Shut yeah. Down, y'all. Yeah. So, so Holly Sampson was a porn actress, and and suddenly everyone's talking about uh, uh Tiger Woods and all the chicks he was banging, and Holly Sampson just came out and said, "Oh yeah, I was one of them. Oh yeah, had sex with Tiger Woods. Had sex with Tiger Woods at a, a party on the bathroom. Yeah, I've had sex with him. <laughs> and then, but then, like a couple of months later, she said." Oh, wait, I thought that saying that I had sex with Tiger Woods would be a popular thing. People hate me now. Um, I didn't do it. I lied. But we know you bang Tiger Woods. (laughs) Bang Tiger Woods, Holly Sampson. Anyway, I digress. Reverend Robert Shields, born in Seymour, Indiana in 1918. That name is familiar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It it will be. He sadly passed away on October 15th, 2007. And upon his death, his diaries were donated to Washington State University. And under the terms of said donation, the diary may not be read or, quote, subjected to a word count for 50 years from his death. So basically, Reverend Robert Shields' diary will be open to the public on October 15th, 2057. So mark your calendars, people! Oh shit, can you believe it? I already have two things scheduled that day. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? That's, al- that's always Murphy's Law. Around here, it's it's laundry day, so, you know... Laundry? <laughs> oh no, that was garbage day. Garbage day. <laughs> uh, I can shuffle things around so I can so I can be there for the diary opening. I'll shuffle things around. Anywho, I digress. At this juncture, you might be thinking to yourself, self, why the word count stipulation there? The word count stippy. Why the stippy, yo? That's probably what you're thinking, Bunny. I, you've got a look that says, why the stippy yo? Yes. You've always had that sort of, well, let me tell you. Well, let me tell you something, brother. Reverend Shields' diary consists of well over 37 million words. And his full diary fills 91 boxes. Why 91 boxes? Because this certified mad lad successfully chronicled every five minutes of his life 
from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. every day from 1972 until 1997. Every five minutes of his life was chronicled in his diaries. Bunny, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Robert 155. I really have to pee. <laughs> you have no idea, Bonnie, how right you are. Robert Shields had a diary where he chronicled every five minutes of his life for 25 years. According to NPR, who managed to interview him before his death, his office had six, count them, six IBM typewriters in case the other fives broke. And he would sleep for no more than two hours at a time so that he could wake up and chronicle each dream individually. He also left nose hair samples in his diary, quote, for DNA purposes, you know, because in the future, uh, surgery is the new sex. Yeah. So, uh, Bob Shields, nothing if not thorough. I also just like another thing, besides the fact that he was certifiably insane and chronicled every five minutes of his life for 25 years, I like it when you see a name and it sounds like a Ford dealership. Yes. Come on down to Bob Shields Ford this Friday and Saturday. Free hot dogs for the kids. So, he would oftentimes record his body temperature and his blood pressure. And, of course, he recorded every bowel movement and every pee for 25 years. And so, I'm looking into this crazy, this crazy ass dude. Trying to learn more about him. What makes him tick? the Reverend Shields. And uh, he, here was the stunning part. Really stunned. Really stunned. He was married and had three kids. <laughs> and is that in his diary? No offense to the dead. However, how do you manage to be a good father and an e at least semi decent husband when you're writing a 37.5 million word chronicle of every five minutes of your life for 25 years. I'm just saying. I don't think he was the most caring, attentive husband. I don't think he was probably the world's best dad. 1235. Lisa let out a moan. I may have found the clitoris. <laughs> he wrote so intensely because he believed that if he stopped, it would be, quote, like turning off my life. And again, uh, call me crazy. Crazy. Thank you. But first... It, doesn't this sound like a Will Ferrell movie waiting to happen? Yes, it does. Can't you see it? Because yes, it I can. I can 100% see... Uh, not Jim Carrey. Will Ferrell. I can 100% see Will Ferrell starring in the... Uh, in the... Reverend R Shields movie. So... Uh, as per the, as per the stippy, people aren't allowed to read it right now. However, passages have been leaked. Okay. And I have some here for you, Bunny. These are legitimate breakdowns of Robert Shields' diary. He chronicled literally every five minutes of his life for 25 years. He would start at 12 a.m. sleeping, 12.05, sleeping, 12.10, farted, sleeping. You know, it, so here are some breakdowns of his life. July 25th, 1993, 7 a.m. I cleaned out the tub and scraped my feet with my fingernails to remove layers of dead skin. 
Yes. 7.05 a.m. Past a large firm stool and a pint of urine used five sheets of paper. <laughs> and again, these are real passages. I'm not uh, taking the piss. These are real, actual passages of his diary. April 18th, 1994, 6.30 to 6.35. I put in the oven two Stouffer's macaroni and cheese at 350 degrees. <laughs> 6.35. Five to six fifty. I was at the keyboard of the IBM Wheel Writer making entries for this diary. Six fifty to seven thirty. I ate the Stouffer's macaroni and cheese, and Cornelia ate the other one. I'm assuming that's the name of the wife. Grace decided she didn't want one. Seven thirty to seven thirty-five. We changed the light over the back stoop since the bulb had burned out. Thank God you gave this to the university. They're really going to love it. Yes. Uh, April 30th, 1994, <clears throat> 11 to 11.30. I picked over parts of Newsweek and Time and Harvard Magazine and reread them while I ate about a dozen, uh, about a dozen leftover fish sticks cold. Oh. August 21st. 1994, 225 to 235. I checked on whether our country tax, county tax payment had been received. It had. So these are the diaries of uh, Robert Shields. Uh, thank God he donated them to science because uh, I think scientists are really going to get a lot out of this. Yes. Uh, he continued to chronicle his life in five minute increments until he had a oh my goodness can, can someone help me with dogs someone in the house could I get help maybe close the door or something okay thank you uh, freaking dogs he continued to chronicle his life in five-minute increments until he had a stroke that left him disabled in 1997. Now, I'm really sorry about this next part because I think it's kind of funny. Okay. Um, because he just had a stroke and he's disabled now. I shouldn't find this funny, but I do. So Bob is all, oh, Grace is the name of the wife. Grace is the name of the wife. So uh, Reverend Shields. So then who the hell is Cornelia? Maybe that's their kid? Because they did have three kids. But, okay. So Reverend Shields is like, Grace, my beloved wife. I have had a stroke and can no longer continue my diary. So you must take up my cause. You, my beloved wife, must write my life and continue with my life's work. Go now, beloved wife. Go to my IBM typewriter and chronicle. Continue to chronicle my days in five-minute increments. Continue my work so that I may live on. Let us start now. Write this down. 835. Scratch my nutsack. And the wife is all like, Okay. Yay. No. <laughs> no. So she tried doing it for a while and then gave up. <laughs> so it, uh, that's the story of Reverend. Bob Shields, the new patron saint of writers. Oh, this okay. is a 100% true story, and I freaking love it. I think it's wonderful. I, it, it, and it's funny because sometimes I will want to write something. I have an idea for a book, and I want to write it, but it's like, oh, I don't really have any time. And it's like, if you, if you are thinking that, if you're like, oh, I need to sit down in front of the computer, I need to sit and write this, 
Think of Robert Shields, okay? Yes. If Robert Shields can fin- can fill 91 boxes with his diary, you probably have a novel in you. <laughs> yeah. You've got the time. So I really do think <sighs> that... Uh, I really do think that... Uh, move over St. Francis de Sales, the Roman Catholic saint of writers and journalists. Now we've got Bobby Shields. Yes, we do. And I looked him up because his name sounds familiar, so I thought I might have seen him somewhere or something like that. But everything he comes up with is Robert Shields, wordy diarist. Mm hmm. That's him. Meticulous diarist. Yeah, I didn't know diarist was a thing until I, lo- I, until I um, looked into this chat. Detailed diarist. Diarist. Yeah. That's a new word for me. That was 100% new. Yeah. So, so in this particular case, Jesus really took a backseat to the diary, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he used to be a reverend. Now he just diarists. Yeah. Hey, rib music. I remember rib music. Rib, rib music. music. Just passed above our heads. That was a good chef. Um, speaking of chefs, what do you think about the trailer for the Great Emu War? Yes, that was great. That was a good chef. Yes, it was. Really nice to see a good-looking trailer for a chef. Okay, ten minute so warning. That's, so that's it for Steve's historic approximations this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about a movie franchise and its. Troubles with censorship. I'm really excited. This we're going to talk about and the problem it has had with the Motion Picture Association of America. So join us next week for more educational, educational fun with Steve's historic approximations. And cut on.